Our Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight in the name of Jesus. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. As a day does not begin in the morning, but begins in the evening. Therefore, my Father, we bless your name. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise in this time and in this season. And I ask the Lord, you will open our eyes to see and our ears to hear that we may know and understand the mystery of the day of atonement and of your blood. Your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you get me my shofar? Tonight um, is a day of atonement. It begins tonight. And we've been praying over 40 days, preparing ourselves for a time and a season like this. And every year I spend time by the grace of God to explain what a day of atonement is about. And then I will go through the benefit of the day of atonement. We will then break bread and share communion with each other and anoint ourselves with oil for a new time and for a new season. And as we have um, gone through the scriptures extensively about what the Day of Atonement is about, then also the Sunday preluding Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Trumpet, I spend time to go through all the feasts. And um, tonight, I am going to intentionally focus on the blood, the mystery of the blood of the day, the mystery of the blood of the atonement. I'm going to focus on the blood. What is so special about blood that God emphasizes on it? So I wanted to begin to talk to the Lord and say, open my eyes and give me a deeper understanding about what it is about. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. And therefore, my Father, we come before you at this time in the name of Jesus. That as we have blown the shofar, we ask, O oh God, that the angels that are assigned to the day of atonement on a day like this will begin to ascend and descend. That tonight we will not dream of ordinary dreams. Our dreams are by the dreams of heaven. And our lives will be transformed in the name of Jesus. And we will never be the same again. Tonight, as I want to talk about the blood, I also want to give you a prelude from a New Testament perspective of what the Day of Atonement is about. Because many times, people always jump to the conclusion that the feast is all about the Old Testament. It has nothing to do with the New Testament, the New Testament, which is not really true. So on your own, I will say, read Leviticus chapter 16, but I want, you, I want to concentrate on the New Testament to bring revelation and to bring understanding. So I want you to open your Bible 
So Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, and um, start reading from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 1. Had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoebread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Okay, stop there. Now the writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is giving us a prelude as to what really happens in heaven because Moses built the tabernacle according to the revelation God gave him concerning the tabernacle in heaven. There is a tabernacle in heaven. And based on that pattern, Moses built the tabernacle and Solomon followed the same pattern by building the temple. And the Bible says, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. So there were ordinances that were instituted by the divine. It's not earthly, it is what? It is divine, but it was on earth. But there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, that place that's called the sanctuary, you can write it down, it's called the holy place. The holy place, that's the second um, the, the temple and the tabernacle were split into three. The first part is called the outer court. The second part is called the inner court, which is called, which is also called the holy place, and which is also called the sanctuary. Now that is where the candlestick, the table, and the shoe bread is. They are all in the inner court. And I hope you understand that the representations there are all about Jesus. The candlestick is saying, I am the light of the world. The shoe bread is saying, I am the bread of life. The whole tabernacle and the whole principle of the temple is about one man, Jesus Christ. And so in verse 3, it says, read verse 3. And after the second veil... The tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So after the second veil. Now, what is Hebrews talking about? After the second veil. Does that mean there was a first veil? Yes, there was. There is the outer court. Now, for you to enter the inner court, which is called the sanctuary, which is also called the holy place, you have to go through a veil. A veil was like this, like a curtain. So the first curtain that enters even just the outer court, the door was called the way. It was called the way. To get into the outer court, they named the first door the way. To get into the inner court, which is called the sanctuary, which is called the holy place, that curtain in the doorway is referred to as the truth. And to get into the holy of holies, it is referred to as the life. So when Jesus came in the New Testament, in John chapter 14, verse 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was saying he was the tabernacle that Moses made. He was saying, I am the all in all. I am everything that Moses built in the tabernacle. Now you saw the shadow in the Old Testament. I have come as the reality. And that is why Jesus told the Jews that I will destroy this temple and in three days I will build it back. 
he wasn't talking about the physical temple they could see. He was talking about his body. So, because his body was the temple. Do you understand why our bodies are the temple? And therefore, we must glorify God in our bodies because our bodies are symbols of a temple. A child of God is supposed to be a walking tabernacle. So you cannot use your body to do any just anything you want. And so that is why the Bible says, he that commits adultery lacketh understanding. Because when you understand the principle of the temple, you will not commit adultery. No matter how the temptation is, you won't do it. Because you know by doing, by, by committing immorality, you are desecrating the temple of God. You are desecrating your body, which is the temple of God, and whoever you are committing the morality with, you are desecrating the temple of God. And if you desecrate the temple of God, of course, God will react. There will be judgment. And so Joseph had an understanding way before Moses saw the template. He realized, no, how can I do such a wicked thing against my God? Because my body is what? The temple. And so as we go through and this time of day of atonement, Understand that before we even got to Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Trumpet, we've been spending time consecrating our bodies, consecrating our soul, our spirit, everything on the altar unto the Lord. Now, read verse 3 again. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Keep reading. Which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Stop there. Now the Bible says, within the holiest of all, which is the Holy of Holies. Now, in the Holy of Holies, the high priest is not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies Anytime he wants. He's only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once every year. And when you read the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, because you will find that the sons of, and in Exodus, you will find the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. The Bible said they have a strange word, fire. And the Lord killed them. They tamper with the things of the Holy of Holies. And that contains the glory of God. Because there were strict instructions as to when you can enter, how you enter, and what do you do. And they disobeyed it, and God killed them. Now, the contents of the um, Holy of Holies, there's a mention of a golden pot that had the manna. Now, remember, the manna was what they ate in the wilderness. Christ Jesus is the manna they ate in the wilderness. That's the prophetic symbolism about the manna. The manna represents Christ. And then you have Aaron's rod that budded. Remember in the Old Testament, back again in the Old Testament, that God told Moses that the elders to bring all their rods and everything, and we're going to see which one is going to bud. And they were all dry rods, and it was only Aaron's rod that budded. Only Aaron's rod that budded. Now, why did Aaron's rod bud? Aaron was the high priest. The rod represented Jesus again. The rod was a dry rod. And then it budded. It represented the death and the resurrection of Christ. So Aaron's bud, Aaron's rod that budded represented the death and the resurrection of Christ. 
and the table of the covenant, the, the, the tables of the covenant, he's not talking about wooden tables now. He's talking about the tablets of the Ten Commandments. That's what he's talking about. And over, read, read from verse, verse 5. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So sh- now, the next thing is the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat, you had the Ark of the Covenant, and on the mercy seat, the mercy seat was not a chair that you sit on. The mercy seat was an altar. But it was a specific altar that had two symbols of cherubims. Now, cherubims are a class of angels. They are the class of angels responsible for the protection of the throne of God. Write it down. Cherubim, one is a cherub, two are cherubim. Cherubim are a class of angels whose job is to protect the throne of God. Their job is to protect the throne of God. And so when God asked Moses to make a replica of what was in heaven, he asked him to design a mercy seat with two symbols of cherubims. Cherubim has four wings. They have two pair of wings to cover their face and two to cover their feet. The cherubim differs from the seraphim. The seraphim are responsible for the glory of God. They protect the glory of God. The cherubim protect the throne of God and the seraphim protect the glory of God. May the heavens open over somebody tonight to see that in reality in the name of Jesus. The seraphim have six wings. They have one to cover their face and they have one to fly and one to cover their feet. But the cherubim have a unique structure. They have four faces. They have four faces. Now, on their face, and they don't move, they don't turn around like me, who have to turn around to see what's going on in my back. They have eyes at the back of their head. They have eyes in front. They have eyes here and they have eyes here. They got four faces. One of the faces is like that of a man. Write it down. One of the faces of the cherubim is like that of a man. One of the faces is like that of a man. And the second of their faces is like that of a lion. And the third of their face is like that of an ox, like a cow. And the fourth of their face is like that of an eagle. Say, how do you know that? Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 1. um, Start from verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, 
as the color of amber out of the mist of the fire, also out of the mist thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Four living creatures. These four living creatures are cherubim. Keep reading. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. So the Bible is very clear about the description of these angels. These angels, angels are in ranks. Um, they, they are in ranks. These are not the normal angels. They, these are high rank angels. And the Bible says that they have the they have. They have four faces. Keep reading. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides. And they had, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every as for the likeness of their faces. They four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. And their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. Now, you're seeing the description of these cherubim. Now, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. I just wanted to show you where. I was getting that explanation from the scripture interpret itself. We don't have to make anything up. And over in the cherubim of glory, verse 5. And, oh, ov read. and over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. But I can speak particularly about it now because I've shown you how they look like. And um, they have four faces. There's a reason why they have four faces. The four faces are prophetic in nature and they represent the four sides of the gospel. It is not coincidence that there are four gospels in the Bible, not five. In the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew depicts Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The gospel, according to Mark, depicts Jesus as the burden bearer, the ox. The gospel, according to Luke, depicts Jesus as a man. So when you read the book of Luke, you're going to find son of man, son of man, son of man. You can see that expression, son of man. The gospel, according to John, the piss Jesus as an eagle, one that came from heaven. So when you take the book of John, you're going to see that it doesn't tell you the genealogy of Jesus. It just starts. And then John the Baptist said, behold, the lamp of God that take away what? The sin of the world. And then a voice comes from heaven. This is my what? My beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Everything straight ahead became very heavenly. And so this is the picture of the temple. Now, it helps to understand these things so you can appreciate what Jesus has done on the cross. Now, verse 6. Let me read. It's not working. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. I want you to read verse 6 and 7 together. Verse 6. 
Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. Now, stop there. What is he talking about by calling one as a first tabernacle? The first tabernacle is, he's talking about the first side of the temple, not the outer court, but he's talking about the inner court. Now, the priests were also in ranks. Now, number one, the first group of priests, you know, in the New Testament, people think that there's no order in the kingdom and they can do anything when they want to do it because they too are priests. You're wrong. God always have order. In the angelic, there is an order. In the priesthood, there is an order. And so if you don't submit to other, you're not going to get anywhere. The first group of priests are called, the, it's just a tribe of priests, the Levites. The Levites were responsible for the work of the temple and the work of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in place before the temple was built. So when I use the two together, please understand me. The Levites were called the house of priests. They were responsible for fixing things in the temple, making sure all the sacrifices and all the offerings and everything was what? Was in place. However, there was another group that had been promoted higher. After the Levites, then you have the priests. Now, the Levites had a specific way of dressing that was different from those who were priests. The priest's gown is not the same as the Levi's gown. There was a difference. And the priests were allowed to go as far as the outer court, the inner court, where the shoe bread and the candle lights are. That's how far the priest can go. No priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. The only person that goes into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And there's a reason for it. In Christ Jesus, we are priests. A royal priesthood and what? A holy nation. But we have one high priest. And that one high priest is Christ Jesus what? Himself. Now, keep reading. The priests went always into the first tabernacle, yes. accomplishing the service of God. What service of God did the priests do, the high priests do in that place? The, the, the ordinary priests, they went there to do the service of God. That, keep reading, verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone. Into the second, which means that he's talking about just the holy place and the holy of holies. Into the second went the high priest alone. How many times? Once every year. Once every year. Now, the entering, the timing, the season of the high priest entering into the Holy of Holies once a year is what is called the day of atonement. So, today is the day the high priest will enter the place. Now, when the high priest enters the place only once but before he enters the place there is a due other as to what he must do read verse 7 again but into the second went the high priest alone once every year not without blood not without blood that's king james go to the um amplified classic version if we go to the ampli not without blood can confuse the younger generation as to what is he talking about. What he's saying is that you cannot enter that place without blood being in your hands. You must carry blood into the place. But into the second division of the tabernacle. Good. Into the second division of the tabernacle. None but the high priest goes. Correct. And he only, and he only wants a year. And never without taking a sacrifice of blood with him. Never without taking a sacrifice of blood with him. If he dares goes there without blood, he will die. He will die. He cannot enter the place without blood. 
And he cannot enter the place where sin in his life. So read on. Which he offers for himself and for the errors and sins of ignorance and thoughtlessness which the people have committed. So first of all, when you, if, if um, because of time, I'm not going to go to that. But then when you go to Leviticus chapter 16, you will find that the first thing the high priest does is he takes a bullock, which is a male big bull, kills the male bull as a sacrifice for himself so that the blood will cover his own personal what? Sins. And then he will take another animal to sacrifice again, this time for his family. Then after that, he will then proceed to the nation. God deals with individuals. He deals with families. And he deals with what? Nations. Sometimes God's dealings with nations are different from God's dealings with individuals. And many times people don't understand that because we think the Old Testament is not important and we don't take time to look at this. Now, what I just said, somebody might be asking a question, but I don't see in the scripture we read that he did that for his family. So I want to bring discretion to that. Go to Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 10. Now read verse 11. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering. Now Aaron, Aaron was the high priest. Moses was the prophet. Now Aaron, being the high priest, will bring what? The bullock of the sin offering. The bullock of the sin offering for who? Which is for himself. Which is for himself. Number one. And shall make an atonement for himself. Then after he will make an atonement for himself. The word atonement is payment for sin. And the only currency that pays for sin is blood. The word atonement means payment. Is atoning. The blood is standing, is buying, is paying. The only currency that deals with sin and deals with destinies, then deals with life, is blood. There is no other currency in the realm of the spirit that is acceptable except blood. Read it again. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And for his house. That's where family comes in. So in all these 40 days, we have followed the biblical prophetic patterns of God by consecrating ourselves unto the Lord and looking deep into our hearts and asking the Lord to do a heart what? Heart surgery. This is what the whole thing is about. Because on a day like this, we are approaching the messy seat. And for approaching the messy seat, you should have done all of this. So Aaron does a sin offering for himself. It does an atonement for himself and then for his house. And then keep reading. And shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Yes. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. Yes. And his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord. Yes. That the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Because 
if it does not put the incense there for the smoke to cover the glory of God that will be on the mercy seat, the glory will slay Aaron. Aaron will die. Now, incense is a symbolic, symbolic thing for worship. All these things that is written in the Old Testament, they have, they have prophet, serious prophetic symbolism. They're not just there um, because God wanted us to read about the history of the Israelites. No, they are there for us to give us an understanding about the real price, price Jesus paid. Now, read verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. Eastwards. The Bible says you will take the blood of the bullock, dip his fingers in it, and what would he do with it? Sprinkle it on what? The mercy seat. In what direction? Eastwards. Because the east is where the altar of God is. We'll sprinkle it eastwards. Very important to understand this. So do you now understand, for example, one of the Bible studies, I spend time to explain the importance of consecrating your hands, the importance of consecrating what? Your fingers. Now, keep reading. And before the mercy seat, shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. The Bible says he sprinkled the blood, how many times? Seven times. Seven times. He sprinkles the blood seven times. If you go and study the New Testament, when Jesus hung on the cross, you'll be shocked how many times and how many words Jesus spoke while he was on the cross. Spoke seven times. Everything has a meaning. So, for example, if I don't know the Old Testament and I just pick the book of Hebrews, I will be talking on the surface. And this is the reason why you need to appreciate both sides of the Bible. Keep reading. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people. That is for the people. So number one, he killed one for himself, the bullock. Then he did one for his family. Now he killed one for the nation. So there are certain times when we do things prophetically that people don't understand why we do that. People will ask questions like, why can't we just pray in our houses and that's it? Do we really have to go all out and do all these prophetic actions and everything? Yes, we do. Because they are the patterns of God. And God doesn't change his patterns. The only difference is we have a better covenant by the blood of the Lamb. But the patterns remain the same. Now, on a day like this, you need to set your life before you, are, you approach what? The mercy seat. Keep reading. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. So he did the, the blood of the bullock seven times and he's going to do that with the goat also or? Seven times. Seven times to signify that his purity and sanctification was complete as a high priest. And seven times for the purification of the nation so that the nation will have a new, a new slate. So on this day, any sin problem you have in your, your life that you are battling with, they, this, thing, they, this sin is a besetting sin. I want to tell you that approach the mercy seat by faith. Because the blood that you are speak, the blood that you are appealing to speaks of better things than the blood of bulls and of cows and of goats. Now, go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9.
Now in Hebrews chapter 9, um, keep reading. Where we left off, just keep reading. Verse 7. Yes. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while well as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Until the time of reformation. What's the Bible talking about? In the Old Testament, when they did all these sacrifices of animals and the blood and everything, the blood covered their sin. In the New Testament, it does not cover your sin. It washes away your sin. So the day of atonement, on a day like this, because the feast is of the Lord Jesus, the understanding what a day of atonement is makes you to appreciate what he did at Calvary for us. It, just imagine we live in those times where we have to bring animal sacrifice. Some of us cannot even afford a whole chicken. Not to talk about goats and cows and bullocks. And so we will remain in our sin. But he made one sacrifice for us all. What manner of love is this? That the Father has bestowed upon us. And we too should be called the sons of God because of the blood of his son. Now, having understood and got an understanding of the picture, now I know I have brushed certain things over and um, I didn't explain everything in Hebrews chapter 9. Don't worry. Our next book study is going to be on the book of what? Hebrews. So you can go ahead and start from Hebrews chapter 1. It's only 13 chapters. Start from Hebrews chapter 1. And I will tell you if, you, if you want to understand Hebrews, then go to Leviticus. Because if you don't start from Leviticus, there are things you're going to read in Hebrews, you're going to know and understand it on the surface. That's the clue. So when we finish the feast, the book we are going to study is the book of Hebrews. Because by the time we finish studying the book of Hebrews, you will not have any doubts. You will understand what the concept of the priesthood is about. What the concept of the offices of God is about. What the concept of the blood is about. What the concept of the communion. A lot of people don't understand these things. It, they become religious relics. Because you need to understand it. If you don't understand it from God's point of view, you'll just be saying, I'm a royal priesthood. What does it mean to be a royal priesthood? What does it mean when you say, I cover myself with the blood of the Lamb? What does it mean to say that we overcome the dragon by what? By the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? What does it really mean to say that the blood of the Lamb has washed my sins away? There are depths to these things. And as we study the book of Hebrews, it will be an unveiling. Don't miss the studies in the book of Hebrew and invite someone to also get blessed. Amen. Now, go to verse 11. Now you're going to read about the time of what? Reformation. Verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come yes by a greater and more perfect tabernacle yes not made with hands that is to say not of this building the bible is saying that christ jesus came and it came as a high priest number one number two of a better tabernacle he is a high priest 
of a better tabernacle in heaven. And so he's perfect. He's a perfect person. And he has come for us. Keep reading. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the Bible says Christ Jesus, who is our high priest, entered. He entered into the holy of holies once. Aaron had to do it every once a year. Jesus doesn't have to do that because his order is not according to the order of the Levites. It's according to the order of the Melchizedek. And so he doesn't have to make sacrifice for his own sin because he lived without what? He lived without sin. And the Bible says he has a perfect tabernacle, both in body and in spirit. And it's not made by man, nor of this building. Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That scripture is deeper than it meets the eye. The Bible says that he did not enter into the holy of holies, with the blood of goats, because that's what Aaron did. Aaron collected the blood of goats in a bowl and then went there. He did one with the bullock and sprinkled with how many times? Seven times. And took that out of the goat for the nation and did that what? Seven times. But the Bible is saying that when it came to Christ Jesus, behold, the lamp of God that take away the sin of the world. Christ Jesus is a mystery. Christ himself is a mystery. He doubles up through our scriptures that the ordinary mind cannot understand. For example, he is the beginning and the end. Now, well, you either the beginning or what? The end. You can't be A and be Z. In his world, he can be the beginning and the end. The first and what? The last, for example, we studied the book of Revelation and we were told Jesus is the root of David and the offspring of David. How can you be a root and at the same time be the offspring? Offspring being the fruit of David. Christ is a mystery. That's why the gospel cannot be understood by knowledge gained from the university. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to help you to understand. For example, is the Bible is telling us that Jesus is a high priest. But who was the sacrifice? So he was the high priest, but then he was the sacrificial lamb too. Behold, the lamp of God that take away what? The sin of the world. I wanted to read verse, verse 12 again. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. By his own what? Blood. Which means he was killed. But this high priest was killed and his blood was drained and he was still alive. So you see, Christ has double sides to himself. So it should not be a surprise to you that he is a high priest and at the same time, he's a lamp of God that take away the sin of the world. Because we see that picture all over. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the root and he's the offspring. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb. What has lion and the lamb? Just put two the animal. One will eat the other one. But he has the picture of a lion and he has a picture of what? The lamb. Christ is a mystery. And so salvation is not the work of man. The father you know Jesus shall make you humble. I repeat, the father you know Jesus shall make you humble. You did not find Jesus. He found you. Oh, when I gave my life to Christ. No, 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 no. When he gave his life for us. When I came to Christ. No, 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 no. When he called you. There is nothing we have done concerning the mystery of salvation. It's all Christ. 
You have to learn to appreciate that and handle that with care, not with carelessness. Read verse 12 again. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hold on. So he entered into the holy of holies as our high priest. But then he carried his own what? His own blood. And when he carried his own blood, he then went there and obtained eternal redemption for us. Which means he went to purchase us. So blood is not an ordinary thing. Blood is not an ordinary thing. Now, let me slow down. Whether, let me start from the blood of animals. Blood of animals is not ordinary. That's why God instituted in the law that you should not eat what? Blood. Because blood is the life bearer of the animal. Blood is life. Write it down. Blood is life. Number one, blood is life. And that's in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. He told them, don't eat blood. So those of you that are still eating blood in the name of, um, um, what do they call it? Hmm? No, they, this, this is blood meal. Blood pudding. Yes. And black, black pudding. And then they put it on your breakfast plate and everything. You cannot go far in the realms of the spirit by still eating that. Don't eat blood. You see, there are laws God put in the Old Testament. He didn't have to to the children of Israel. It was just a law you were supposed to what? Obey. The more you study the scripture, you know, oh, oh, there is a reason and a meaning, a deeper meaning to these laws. They're not just laws. One of the things he told the children of Israel is that you cannot sleep with a woman that is on his menses. When I found it, I was shocked. It's right in the Bible. You cannot sleep with a woman. But are you going to use contraception or not? You're not supposed to do it. Why? Because blood is life. And the blood the woman is shedding is, is his ex. It's her ex, isn't it? That is coming out in the form of what? Blood. So the blood that is passing on is life. And God doesn't want you to touch it. So these laws, they're not archaic laws. There are reasons for it. Because if you tamper with it, you are also cutting your flow in the things of hearing God. Your synergy with hearing God, your frequency begins to lower. Just calm down because... You get yourself involved in all these kind of things. By the time you get to the point of shedding innocent blood via abortion, your heaven is then shut against you. Because that blood is innocent. It hasn't even had a chance to be born to commit sin. So that blood begins to speak. Now the Bible says Cain killed what? His brother Abel. And the blood of Abel was what? Was speaking. Write it down. Blood speaks. Blood is not ordinary. It speaks. Blood has a voice. It can talk. And so when Jesus carried his blood and he entered into the Holy of Holies behind the veil, what was he doing? Because the blood he was carrying, his own blood, began to speak on our behalf. The blood began to speak on my behalf and it began to speak on your behalf. The mystery of blood. When Jesus entered there with his blood, the blood, blood is a negotiator. Write it down. Blood negotiates. It was by his blood he negotiated with his father for our redemption. Read verse 12 again. 
neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He obtained. Now, when you go to the supermarket and you want to obtain bread, what do you do to obtain bread? You pay for it. And so the apostle Peter wrote to the church and said that you were not bought with corruptible things. You were bought by what? The precious blood of what? Of the lamb. So blood is a currency. Write it down. Blood is a currency. We were bought with the precious blood of the lamb. On the day of atonement, blood becomes a mediator, becomes a break between the father and his children. Now, in legal, in law, there's a type of session of law called mediation, where you take the case out of court and you begin to sell it out of court, but it's still a form of legal proceedings, but it's not as severe as um, using criminal law or civil law or anything. So you just decide that, okay, let's mediate between these two opposing what people and settle the issue between them. The blood became a bridge to mediate between man and the father. So the blood of the lamb does that. Now, I want you to open your Bible to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. He purchased us with what? Own blood. If it was his own blood, then it was the blood of God because Jesus is God. So the blood of God purchased us. It's a currency. It's a negotiator. It's a mediator. It speaks. Blood is not ordinary. Now, let me flip for you to have an understanding concerning the mystery of blood. This is where many Christians miss the point. When a voodoo man tastes chicken, somebody goes to see a voodoo man and the voodoo man says, you're going to bring chicken. So I have this, so you're going to bring a chicken. What's he going to do with the chicken? He needs blood. First John chapter 5. There are three that bear witness what? In heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And there are three that bear witness on the earth. What? The water, the blood, and the spirit. So the first thing the voodoo man does is he sacrifices the chicken. Now, if you listen, first of all, he's going to ask you, why are you here? What do you want? Based on what you tell him, that's when he will tell you, bring a chicken, bring a goat, or bring a cow. So the magnitude of your problem will determine what kind of blood is going to what? demand. Then he will kill the animal. He now has what? Blood. All he needs is water. And with blood and water, he will then tell you that give some, give a sacrificial what? Offering. You then take money and give the sacrificial offering to the voodoo man. And then you will look into the blood and begin to smile and begin to make incantations. What is he doing? Because as long as he looks in the blood is life and life can determine, he can see the future. And when he looks into the blood, he then calls upon spirits, demonic spirits to come. Because once you have water and you have blood, then a spirit must come. There are three that bear record what? On the earth. And when Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says he died and the centurion came, pierced his side, and what came out? Water and what? 
and blood. Water and blood came out of him. By the coming out of the water and blood, after the water and blood came out of him, what was the next major thing that happened to the church? The Holy Spirit came. He died. He shed his blood. His water came out. And then he said, go, tarry ye. The promise of the Father, the Spirit is going to come. Every time water and blood, then the next thing is what is a spirit. Now, the principle is the same on the side of Satan and is the same on the side of God. So on a day like this, when you go before God and say, God, I've come and I want the blood to speak for me. There are issues in my bloodline. There are issues from my paternal line. There are issues from maternal, my maternal side. There are issues of blood. And you go to the mercy seat. The Bible says in the New Testament, it says, come to, the, come to the throne of grace with what? With boldness. So because of what Christ has done, we can approach the Father with what? With boldness. But as we approach the Father with boldness, appealing by the blood of the Lamb that he shed for us, don't appear before God in with what? Empty hands. We disobey it. All we want is just the blood, just the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. But when it comes to giving an offering, we have no understanding that there's a law of the spirit to seal everything. Now you're not paying for the blood. You can't pay for the blood. You cannot pay for the blood. But an offering seals an altar. And the juju man and the voodoo man and the occultic people understands that. The church don't understand the principle of the blood. And I want to tell you it's the same thing. I want you to open your Bible to second, go to second Kings chapter three. Second Kings chapter three. Second Kings chapter three. And just go down in 2 Kings chapter 3 and um, read on when can Misha sacrifice his son. You found it? 2 Kings chapter 3. Right. Start from verse 26. Verse 26, and yes. when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him. And the king, when the king of Moab, this man is an occult king. Okay, I want you to pay attention how the things in the realm of the spirit works. He took with him 700 men that drew swords. Yes. To break through even onto the king of Edom. Yes. But they could not. They could not. The king of Moab was fighting against Edom and Israel has formed an alliance against Moab. And the king of Moab was struggling. He was losing the war. But he did something that turned the war around. Keep reading. Verse 27. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. He took his eldest son for God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten what? Son. He gave his only begotten son. And this occult king understood the law of the spirit. That if he can sacrifice his eldest son, which means his firstborn. Just as the father had planned to sacrifice his firstborn, he will win the war. He took his firstborn, sacrificed his firstborn, shed blood. The moment he shed blood, he invoked spirit. And the moment the spirits in the realms of the spirit landed in the war, read the rest of the story. And there was great indignation. There against was great Israel. indignation against Israel. Where did the indignation come against Israel from? The realms of the spirit. He invoked it with his own son's blood. And so when we go to scriptures like, um, um, I, well, I overcome him by the blood of the lamb. My friend, what did you do that gave you access to uh, invoke 
the blood of the lamb. There are laws and the realms of the spirit. These things don't just happen. And, for, and so for baby Christians, they think what they see every time, that's all it, there is to it. Sorry, that's not all there is to it. For example, somebody's, I, am, I, I shared um, a clip to a few people and I said, I'm right, right. It's not, they, they just went for evangelism unprepared, entered into a territory unprepared, didn't bother to pray over the place uh, and they thought everything was going to just happen. So it doesn't happen like that. They have to take charge of the place. The same way. And what I'm teaching you, you'll be shocked that when Jesus himself came into the world, he had to obey his own laws. And so if you want to walk in the, in the dimensions of the supernatural and you don't understand these principles, you're not going to succeed. Yes, it is written there. Um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. They overcame him by what? By the blood of the lamb. And by the word of what? Their testimony. How did they overcome him by the blood of the lamb? They had a consecrated life. They were living a pure life. Which means then they had access to what? The throne room. And because they had access to the throne room, that invoked a spirit, the Holy Spirit, to work with them. Water, blood, and the spirit. Water, blood, and what? And the spirit. Without that, nothing happens. Whether he's on God's side or he's on Satan's side. Nothing happens. The Bible says, and there was great indignation against Israel and they departed from him and returned to their own land. They lost the war. They lost the war. And so, when you want to fight battles, for example, and um, battles that have gone on in the, in, the, in the maternal line and everything, and you're in trouble and everything, on a day like this, don't let a time like this pass you by. That's why I'm taking my time to explain the mystery of the blood. Because we know these things in our heads, but do we really understand them in the realms of the spirit? The blood cleanses our sins. First John chapter 1 verse 7. The blood redeems us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. The blood brings forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1 7. The blood justifies us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 and 9. The blood makes us righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. The blood sanctifies us. Hebrews 13 verse 12. The blood speaks a continual plea. And word over us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 to 24. The blood is a mystery. And our cultic people knows that. That's why every witch or wizard has a copy of the Bible. They're not reading the Bible to get born again. They're reading the Bible for the spiritual laws that is in the book. To apply it. And let me tell you, they get results. They apply it and they do what? They get results. And the church reads the theory. I wonder why it doesn't get results. Because they back it up with a full revelation. How did Jesus come into the world? But before I even I go into that, I want you to open your Bible to go to John chapter 20 verse 17. John Chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Now, here is Jesus. He had died and resurrected, and Mary Madeline saw Jesus. I was a Rabona master. It was so happy. She was so happy. She wanted to embrace Jesus. And Jesus said, No, touch me not. I have not appeared what? To my father. What's he talking about? He's talking about the mercy seat. He hasn't gone to heaven yet. And so between the time Jesus died and resurrected. And showed himself. To the disciples. He went to heaven. I'm explaining to you. What we read in Hebrews chapter 9. He went to heaven with a bowl of his blood. And entered. 
into the Holy of Holies, presented his blood to his father. I have not appeared before. Don't touch me yet. I need to appear before my father first. So on a day like this, there is blood that is speaking at the mercy seat for you. All you need to do is to be sincere. And what does the blood do? The blood gives us peace. And so, for example, when you approach God, every, if you've not had peace, you've not had rest of mind and everything, you approach God with the right heart, with the right mind, and with the right attitude, you should have peace. The blood gives peace. The blood releases healing. It was when his back was beaten up and was torn into stress. The blood came. The blood draws us and gives us access to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. The blood is a reconciliator. It reconciles us with the Father. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. I can go on and on and on and on about the mystery of the blood. Why am I taking my time to explain the importance of the blood? Because our Savior, Jesus Christ, when Adam fell, God had a plan. Now, the keys, help me, Holy Ghost, the keys to succeeding on this earth was handed, was put in the hands of Adam. Be fruitful and what? Multiply. And have what? Dominion. So, keys of the kingdom. The kingdom keys was handed to Adam. But Adam and Eve were deceived. Eve was deceived and Adam joined Eve and what happened? They handed the kingdom keys to to Satan. So when Jesus came and died, he had to go to hell. One of the reasons why Jesus had to go to hell was to go and get the keys from what? The hands of Satan. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You see, at the end of this message, if you're paying attention and you're listening to it, you're going to pray the same prayer you used to pray, but because now you have revelation, you pray with faith. That's the difference. You shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. Now, I wanted to read verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And I have the keys of hell and of what? And of death. Now the question is, what delivered the keys of hell and death into the hands of Jesus? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. The blood sacrifice was what delivered keys. And so occulted people understand this principle. They read this story and they go, wow. So for me to have access and dominion in business, what do I have to do? A sacrifice. And then they'll tell them, well, for this, you have to make a human sacrifice or animal sacrifice or you, you have to, and they will make the sacrifice. We are told clearly in scripture. We don't need to do all those sacrifices. Christ Jesus is our sacrifice. He is our Passover what? Lamb. All we need to do is accept what he has done on the cross, what he has done by offering his blood, and in response, give our whole body, soul, and spirit to him. Okay? So that when we give him, when you give him an offering, you're not doing God a favor. God is not broke. You're not doing God a favor. You are activating what has already been written for you. When you don't have that understanding, everything becomes hard to do because you lack understanding. 
Now, he took the, the keys from Satan. But before he could take the keys of Satan away, because remember, this earth, the dominion of this earth was handed over to Adam. So God cannot just come on this earth and take it over. He had to become an Adam. And he had to be born of a woman. He had to come by water and by blood. When a woman is pregnant and is about to deliver, what's the first thing they tell you? Her water do, they has what? Her water is broke. Her water has broken. That's the first thing. Now, after the water, then comes blood. So Jesus himself, he came by water and what? By blood before he was born. And then he had to die by water and by blood before he could get kingdom keys. He's already paid the price. And so the whole aspect of covenant living, understand the whole mystery of covenant living. Abraham understood it before the law. Isaac understood it before the law. Jacob understood it before the law. It's got nothing to do with the law. It is a law of the realms of the spirit. Somebody sent me a WhatsApp message. Now, I hope the person is listening. And the person was very troubled and said, Pastor, I know it's very early and, um, and um, um, I really need an understanding. I'm still going to call the person, but I feel that it will benefit all of you. He said, many people say that the Lord help people more than what? The church. And uh, the Lord people always are doing benevolent things and doing charity works. and everything. It's not for free. It is an understanding of the law of the spirit. For example, I just showed you in 2 Kings chapter 3, where the king of Moab decided to sacrifice his son just to win a war. He sacrificed his own. Do you know what people have sacrificed to become billionaires in the world? Do you know what people sacrifice to become billionaires? Don't let anybody fool you into thinking that it's all about um, huh, all about hard work. Really? Do you know how many people that have done that hard work and have not seen any fruit out of it? You want dominion on this planet? It's by water and by blood. And so from the day you understand that, that is by water and by blood, you begin your thinking changes. Listen to me. Your education alone is not going to take you that very far. Not especially from the years that are ahead of us. You need to understand the mystery of the blood. So for example, when I make an announcement and say, for the subsequent days that are coming, we're going to take the last supper. I am not talking about doing religious relic. There's a revelation behind it. And I want you to catch that revelation. There's a revelation. The last supper is your greatest benefit. Write it down. The greatest mystery God gave to the church was the last supper. It's not about do this in remembrance of me. That's all they taught to you. But there's more to it. There is more to it. Jesus looked at them in John chapter 6 and said, except you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. Why did he say that? Why did Jesus have to say that? It was very offensive. It was not culturally acceptable to eat human flesh and drink human blood. It was against the law in the Roman Empire. So why did Jesus say that? There was a mystery behind it. And the mystery behind it is, anytime you take my body and you take my blood, my life, because blood is like my life is infused into your life. I repeat, when you take the Lord's Supper, you are infusing the life of Christ into your life. It's not, it's not about just remembering Christ. No. It's more than that. And so as you go through as of apostles and you go through the, the writings on the, of the apostles Paul and Peter and the rest, they never played with that. 
Bible says they met in the houses and they broke bread. And they went there and they broke bread. Why did Jesus have to take bread and break and give it to the two disciples on Amos for their eyes to be open? It tells you that the whole idea of the Lost Supper is beyond what we have always known. It's deeper than that. Every time you take that, you are invoking everything Christ paid on the cross into your life. So on a day like this, on a day of atonement, and you're taking the loss, you need to take it with revelation and what? And understanding. You see, God, I try my best. I read the Bible. I don't understand. I haven't got a clue what I'm reading. When I read, I sleep. When I read, I don't understand. And, and, and I really want to understand your word so that I will know you and the power of your resurrection. And you take the Lord's Supper, your eyes will be open. Some of the things, let me tell you, sometimes I'll stand here and the heavens will open. And I just receive downloads just like that. And somebody will phone me and be asking how you know all these things and everything and things like that. You'll be shocked. I didn't get that one in Bible school. It's a mystery. But pay attention to these things and your life will never be the same. You see, God created man in a similitude to the planet. Hmm. Have you noticed that your veins and your arteries looks like roots? They look like roots of plants. A man is a tree. We know that from the book of Judges. Man is a tree. We know that from John chapter 15. I am the true vine. Ye are what? The branches. A man is a tree. And God have used the things he's put on the planet to create man. The Bible says he took the dust of the earth and he made what? He made man, right? So our body is made of dust. So when we die, we go back to what? The body goes back to dust. But what did he use in making our bones, our teeth, and everything? They're stones. They are as hard as the rocks. Our bones are as hard as what? The rocks. Look at your hair. Does that not remind you of grass? It grows your cat. It grows your cat. It grows, and then you cut again. Is this not the soil? And are these not the grass? Hmm? Is this not the soil? My flesh is the soil. The hairs on my skin. Is that not grass? So man was created from, for here. But the mystery of being able to control this planet is by water and by blood. Because Adam and Eve did not obey. So the first thing God did was, when it came, the Bible says they said they were naked. He killed an animal, made a coat to cover them. It was not about covering them. It was about a blood sacrifice. Without a blood sacrifice, they wouldn't have survived on the, Satan would have killed them. Blood speaks. Blood is life. Drain the blood of a man out of his body and he's dead. Yet, this mystery of blood, science can't tell us what blood really is. It can just tell us the components of blood. But it can't tell us where does the power come. Explain to me how when you have a headache, you take a Panadol and the Panadol goes into your belly. But somehow, it knows how to go into your head to heal your headache. Mysteries. How is it that you have a back pain, you take some painkillers and you put it in your belly? And it knows where to go. The mystery of the blood. The blood carries it to where it has to go. The blood. And so young men and young women, 
Blood is not something to be toyed with. It's not something to be played with. For lack of understanding, my people do what? Do parry. They just go and sit at a tattoo parlor and say, draw this on my skin. And they go, bing, 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 and blood is coming. And then they wipe, they wipe the blood that's coming with a the tissue. They wipe it with, 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 with some tissue and say, well, everything's going to be fine. We just put some alcohol and everything. The blood of you that they just collected, who is taking that blood? Do you know where they're taking the blood? Because I can tell you, anything you want to manipulate, you can manipulate it by blood. You can manipulate it by blood. When bacteria goes into your, street, your, your, your body, where do they target? Your bloodstream. They know where to go. Your blood is precious. That is ordinary blood. So if people and occult and other things do understand the importance of blood, you as a child of God should know better. You should know what? You should. The most awe of time is the time of the communion. Is the time of the communion. And so when you're doing it, you need to do it with understanding. It's not an ordinary thing to do. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Now I wanted to read verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats. For and if. Not for the blood of bulls. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead words to serve the living God? The scripture is loaded. God is asking us a question. And the question is this, if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes of Hafer in the Old Testament could cleanse people, could purify people, could bring the miraculous to people, and it was just the blood of animals. If the blood of animals could conjure the supernatural for people who are not born again, who are practicing Diverse kinds of false religions. And because of blood, they can get a miraculous. How much more shall the blood of Christ go through the eternal spirit, the eternal spirit meaning the Holy Spirit, offered himself with a spot to God, pad your conscience from dead ways to serve the living God. That's a challenge. The challenge is, if the blood of animals can make a voodoo priest fearsome, strong, see into the realms of the spirit, do crazy things. How much more would the blood of the lamp of God, the blood of Jesus do for you if you will have understanding? And so tonight, I want you to meditate on this message about the blood. And go to the message seat with boldness. There is no sin, the blood cannot cleanse. There is no demon the blood cannot drive away. Because the, what, what are we, why are we talking about demon? He said they overcame him, the dragon. The dragon, the chief of all the demons. They overcame him all by the blood of the lamb. It is, the blood of the lamb is the ultimate weapon, the ultimate sacrifice. But it is the reason why it can work for one believer and it doesn't seem to work for another believer is the levels of revelations and understanding. That's why I'm taking my time to explain. Is the levels of revelations and understanding. Read verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament. Stop there. What is testament? The word testament is covenant. 
say he is the mediator of the new covenant. How was he able to mediate the new covenant? By his blood. Everything is by the blood. Read it again. 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Yes. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that Now notice death comes in there by means of death, which means he has already paid the price. He's not now going to pay the price. He's already done what? Paid the price. Keep reading. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Help me, Holy Ghost. What the Bible is saying is he's paid the price and because he's paid the price, he has the right to redeem. He has the right to what? To redeem. Redeem. Redemption. Redemption of the transgressions that was under the first testament. What covenant, what testament have your parents and your people, your own saints have put you under? The Bible says there's another blood that is more than whatever covenant, whatever evil whatever demonic stronghold that was put in your life. Some of it, none of your fault, but because of where you come from. There is another blood that can break the chains. If you believe. Read it again. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, I want you to go to, I want you to go to um, the Amplified Classic Version for 16 and 17 together. For, wi for where there is a last will and testament involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Now, what the Bible is saying is, when a man is alive and makes a will, the enforcement of that will cannot be made until the man is what? Dead. And the Bible says Jesus died on the cross. So the will of the Father, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification is paid. And because he has paid everything, my God shall supply all your needs according to what? The riches, what? In glory, what? In Christ Jesus. Because why he died and resurrected. And because he left an inheritance, according to Ephesians chapter 1, we have inheritance. Inheritance we have as children of God, as kings and priests in the kingdom. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and 6. I have made you kings and what? And priests. Now, how does a king and a priest have access to the inheritance Christ has given us in the kingdom? And the way of the access is by blood. But how do we get the access? Because he died. And because he died and resurrected, death has released the enforcement of his will. Therefore, Christ has already died. You don't have to die. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life through who? To Christ Jesus. The, 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 the will of the person who did the will comes to enforcement. It comes to pass when he's dead. Read it again. For where there is a last will and testament involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. The death of the one who made it must be established. Keep reading. For a will and testament is valid and takes effect only at death. Since the will and testament of the person who made the will and the testament is like life insurance. The person that makes the life insurance is not the one that enjoys the life insurance by his children after he is gone. And so Jesus made a life insurance and life assured you. Help me, Holy Ghost. He, he, he life assured you by dying on the cross and leaving you with an inheritance. So you're not supposed to struggle in this life. He has already paid the price. And he has the, the, the release of the promise 
of what is in, inside the wheel is affected because he died. Yeah. And not only has he died, he's on the right hand side of God as our high priest. And he's our advocate. Tonight, he's our advocate pleading our case for us. Is your case sickness? Is your case financial trouble? Is your case, what is your case? Because all of that is in the wheel. One day Peter looked at Jesus and said, Lord, master, we have left all to follow you. What shall we get? And Jesus looked at him and said, anyone that left father, mother, and brothers shall receive brothers, mothers, and sisters in this life. And a hundredfold, bless him, houses and lands. It is the promise of the Lord. It is passed, but the effect of that promise did not come to pass before he died. He's already died and resurrected. That's why he's saying, I'm holding the keys of death and hell. Therefore, any force of darkness that anybody went to the grave to bind you with, I command the power of the grave to be broken over your life in the name of Jesus. By the mystery of the blood. Amen. By the mystery of the blood. Keep reading. For a will and testament is valid and takes effect only at death, since it has no force or legal power as long as the one who made it is alive. So even the old first covenant God's will was not inaugurated and ratified and put in force without the shedding of blood. Do you see that? That even the old covenant, it was enforced, it was done, it was activated by what? By blood, by the shedding of blood. By the shedding of blood. I pray that you do understand. Keep reading. For when every command of the law had been read out by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of slain calves and goats together with water. Do you see that? He took the blood of the animals, the goats and everything. With what? With what? water. So Jesus came by water and blood. He died by water and blood. When he came to Moses, for Moses praying for the nation and the people, he took the blood and took what? Water. Are you aware that your body is 70% water and your blood is 90% water? Yeah, water and blood. Keep reading together with water and scarlet wool and with a bunch of hyssop and sprinkled both the book, the roll of the law and covenant itself and all the people saying these words, this, this is, is the, the blood, blood that seals testament. and ratifies the agreement, the testament, the covenant, which God commanded me Read verse 20 again. to deliver. Saying these words, this is the blood that seals and ratifies the agreement, the testament, the covenant, which God commanded me to deliver to you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood, both the tabernacle. Wait for me. I want to read the Amplified Version. Wait, 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 which verse are you now? 21. 21. 21. Go back. Go back to 20. Verse 20. Saying these words. Saying these words. This is the blood. This is the blood. That seals and ratifies. The, the blood seals. Number one. Number two. The blood word ratifies the agreement. Yes. The testament. Yes. The covenant. Yes. Which God commanded me to deliver to you. Yes. Verse 21. Uh -huh. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the sacred vessels and appliances used in divine worship. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. In fact, under the law, almost everything is purified by means of blood. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed by means of what? Blood. Everything is by blood. You want to succeed on this earth? Everything is by blood. The good news is you have the better blood available to you. You should not be under dominion of any strange blood. Keep reading. And without the shedding of blood, there is neither release from sin and its guilt, 
nor the remission of the due and merited punishment for sins. By such means, therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be purified. But the Hold on. It was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things. So now, do you understand what, why we pray and say, our Father who art in heaven, hello be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done what? On earth as it is what? In heaven. I always tell my friends in the kingdom movement. I say, let me tell you. I know you believe in the kingdom. But the only way you're going to establish the kingdom on this earth is to find out what the kingdom is about in heaven. Keep reading. By such means, therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be purified. But the actual heavenly things themselves require far better and nobler sacrifices than these. For Christ, the Messiah, has not entered into a sanctuary made with human hands, only a copy and pattern and yes. type of the true one. Yes. But he him, but he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the very presence of God on our behalf. Nor did he enter into the heavenly sanctuary to offer himself regularly again. So there is a heavenly sanctuary. I'm reading scripture so you know I'm not making these things up. There is a heavenly sanctuary that Jesus went, that he entered what? Into. To plead our case. This is the day, the day of atonement. Keep reading. Nor did he enter into the heavenly sanctuary to yes. offer himself regularly again and again uh -huh. as the high priest enters the holy of holies every year with blood not his own. Uh -huh. For then would he often have had to suffer over and over again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, but as it now is, he has once for all at the consummation and close of the ages appeared to put away and abolish sin by his sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for all men wants to die, and after that, the certain judgment. Now, we like to quote this scripture, but we never explain the totality of it. Verse 28. Even so, it is that Christ, having been offered to take upon himself and bear as a burden the sins of many once and once for all, will appear a second time, not to carry any burden of sin, nor to deal with sin, but to bring to full salvation those who are eagerly, constantly, and patiently waiting for and expecting him. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says Christ is not coming back again to offer another sin offering. He's already done that. He's coming for those with full salvation. What's he talking? What, what's the Bible talking about as full salvation? Does it, mean, does it mean that we've got half salvation? When you get born again, it's your spirit man that is born again. On the day when Jesus appears, your body, this earthly body, will also what? Receive his own salvation. And so this terrestrial will give away for what? for the celestial. And so this part too will be what? Will be transformed. And our soulish realm is continually being transformed. Renewing of your mind. There are three parts of you. There are three parts of you. And the mystery, let me tell you something. Those that have discovered the mystery of the communion by understanding the mystery of the blood, take advantage of it. Many years ago, I know I have a ministry. Every week, they would do communion. And it was in a Catholic church. Every week, they did, they, they did communion. They would do communion. I was thinking, why do they have to do communion every week? So, they knew something I did not know. And in those days, they had influence but not the level of influence they have what 
they have now. Everything they touch is successful by the mystery of the blood. So please, it is not something to mess around with. Now, it is the day of atonement. I give you the opportunity to talk to your father. Approach the mercy seat with boldness. Talk to him. What is on your heart you want the Lord to do for you? What are the things you need to change from? Open your mouth and talk to your father in heaven. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. I don't know what your weight is. Is it sickness? Is it sin? Is it Satan? He paid the price for all of that. Jesus paid the price for all of that. Lift up your voice and begin to talk to the Lord in prayer. Lift up your voice and begin to talk to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to cleanse you. Ask the Lord to purify you. Ask the Lord to make the mystery of the blood known to you. Ask the Spirit of God to make it known to you. That your life will, your life will be completely transformed tonight and tomorrow. That tonight you want a visitation of the Holy Ghost. Tonight you want to experience the supernatural. You want the heavens to be open to you. You want your eyes to be open. To see beyond the physical. That the name of the Lord will be glorified in your life. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.